Thank you very much for the invitation to speak today. I'm very honored to be part of this course. Um, my talk is entitled Complications After Sleeve Gastrectomy, Leaks, Bleeds, and Thromboembolic Events. These are my disclosures. We're going to start by reviewing bariatric surgical trends, move on to discuss complications we see following sleeve gastrectomy, and also review the endoscopic and medical management of each of these complications. This is data from our Michigan Bariatric Surgical Collaborative and shows the rapid rise in the number of sleeve gastrectomies being performed in Michigan, but this data also mirrors what is happening nationwide. The complications that I was asked to address today include bleeds, thromboembolic events, and sleeve leaks. We are going to spend the majority of the talk discussing leaks, but we will start with bleeds. Bleeding occurs in approximately 2% of patients following sleeve gastrectomy, and rates are higher if the patient has a history of hypertension, portal hypertension, or is on anticoagulation therapy. And as we know, the bleeding can be intraperitoneal or endoluminal, and when treatment is required, most of the time these patients end up going back to the OR. However, since I am an interventional endoscopist, I'm mostly going to provide my thoughts on what endoscopic tools could be useful in the small percentage of patients that we treat endoscopically. And while there are many endoluminal devices, the few that I think would be most useful in this context would be injection needles, mechanical devices, and topical devices. Injection needles consist of three parts and predominantly achieve hemostasis by mechanical tamponade. Here you can see a very brief video of epinephrine injection at the site of GI bleeding. And this is really mainly just to show you how straightforward of an approach this is. Injection devices are also used in combination with mechanical devices. And here you can see a picture of many of the through the scope clips that are currently available. But one thing that I'll stress over and over again is that it's very important to know your device. So all clips are of different sizes, they have different lengths, they have different jaw widths and tail lengths, they perform differently depending on scope position and where the bleed is located along the staple line. Some are able to rotate and reopen and some don't. So it's very important to know your instrument and think about where in the GI tract you are encountering the bleeding. Here you can see a quick example of just how easy it can be to place one of these through the scope clips on an active GI bleed. We also have a variety of cap mounted clips and these are used to compress more tissue than the through the scope clips. And here you can see deployment of one of them on a small bleeding lesion. And as you can see here, these clips are mounted over our scope and using suction and sometimes a variety of other tools that go through the scope channel, you can really pull in the bleeding vessel and get very nice coaptation of the clip on that region. Finally, topical hemostatic agents may play a role. The most common of these is hemospray, and these seal blood vessels via activation of platelets and the intrinsic coagulation pathway. So here's another quick video of an example of what this can look like. And so after clearing the large amount of blood that you can see in the lumen of the GI tract, you really just are able to spray this powder through an endoscopic catheter. And this comes in both seven French and 10 French sizes, but I would highly recommend the 10 French as the seven French tends to clot. Now we are going to very briefly move on to thromboembolic events. And while DVT and PE can occur after sleeves, I'll focus mostly on portal vein thrombosis since it seems more unique to sleeve gastrectomy. And again, just to reiterate, I'm an interventional endoscopist, so we will keep this short. So suffice it to say that this occurs in about 0.3% of cases, and there are several proposed mechanisms and etiologies. And treatment very much depends on clinical severity. Um, anticoagulation therapy in this context is somewhat controversial, but when it is started, it should be maintained for about three to six months um, as it prevents the development of prehepatic portal hypertension. And of course, surgery is reserved for bowel ischemia or necrosis. Okay, so moving on to the bulk of this talk, which will cover sleeve leaks. Sleeve leaks are very much the most feared adverse event following sleeve gastrectomy. As many of us are familiar, these present with tachycardia, leukocytosis, increase in inflammatory markers like CRP. Uh, they can present as fulminant peritonitis or sepsis um, and also eventually lead to fistula formation. 
and they are thought to occur when the intragastric pressure exceeds the burst pressure. And so this is typically precipitated by a distal sleeve stricture. The majority develop at the proximal aspect of the staple line just below the angle of hiss, as this is an area of relative ischemia due to takedown of the short gastric arteries and also a zone of increased pressure. And here you can really see how stenosis of the distal stomach or the incisura region could lead to an increased pressure in the proximal stomach and sort of blow out the proximal staple line. And depending on how long it has been um, since the sleeve surgery, um, oftentimes we will dilate these with pneumatic balloons. And this video is a demonstration of that technique. So as you can see here, we're coming around a really tight um, stricture at the incisura. We advance our upper endoscope into the duodenum, and then through the scope, we're able to pass one of our stiffer endoscopic wires. And then we pass that as far down as we can into the duodenum, and then remove the scope. And um, over this wire, we place a pneumatic balloon. And it's very important to center the pneumatic balloon between the GE junction and the pylorus to prevent perforation of either of those regions. And that area of whitish appearing mucosa demonstrates effective dilation. You can also see the same technique and sort of the straightening out of the balloon on fluoroscopy. The timing of presentation of the leak and the chronicity of the leak very much affect management strategies. So we tend to define acute or early leaks as those that occur within six weeks following the sleeve gastrectomy. And late leaks, those or chronic leaks are those that occur within six to 12 weeks following. The size of the leak very much plays a role in what endoscopic uh, therapy we will offer. And there's a whole um, large endoscopic armamentarium that has been designed to sort of manage um, these sleeve leaks. And again, just to stress, distal dilation of the sleeve leak is imperative. And I really liked this image from Obesity Surgery um, published in 2018 that shows the variety of different types of sleeve leaks because the size of the leak often dictates what type of management strategy we will employ. And so type one leaks are really small leaks with no documented collection. Type two is a leak that's associated with some intra-abdominal abscess. And type three are those that are much more complex and lead to various fistulas throughout the abdomen or thorax. Esophageal stents are often used in early or acute leaks, um, but it's very important for these to span from the distal esophagus to the duodenal bulb. So oftentimes we're considering placement of multiple overlapping stents to achieve adequate extension or coaptation of the wall. And this really allows for um, anti-grade flow of secretions, but it's also important to think about fixating the proximal portion of these stents to the esophageal wall to prevent migration. And of note, the, there are a variety of other stents that are being designed um, around the world that are really truly specific for bariatric use. And hopefully the FDA will approve some of these for use within the US um, in the coming weeks or months. Just to show you what this can look like, this is a large leak um, in a patient who had previously had a lat band and then underwent sleeve. You can see the tight distal stricture on the bottom photo. And here you can see that we've placed a, the largest esophageal stent that we have available. You can see what that looks like both in the esophageal lumen and then following suture fixation of the stent. Pigtail stents are also used very commonly to facilitate drainage of the cavity into the gastric lumen. And the technique that we use after placement is very similar to that of a necrosectomy. Um, these have very high technical success and fewer required procedures than some of the other techniques that we discuss, um, and also lower morbidity or mortality than the covered esophageal stents. The technical success is quite high and the clinical success is somewhere in the 70 to 80 percent range. Here you can see a quick video of what these look like. Um, so here you can see the leak just below the angle of his screen left, um, which is a very, uh, very common place at the proximal staple line to see these leaks. We dilate everything we can distal to the leak to try to um, make sure that the pressure is significantly lower in the distal stomach so that the leak will heal. And here you can see we can now advance our scope easily around that distal stricture. And we are starting to explore this perigastric cavity um, using our ultra slim upper endoscope. What we find in this particular patient is um, that she loved to chew gum and swallow it. Um, and so we're cleaning out her entire cavity of gum. And then once the cavity is cleaned and we've performed some antibiotic lavage, we are placing these very small pigtail catheters between the perigastric space and the lumen of the stomach in order to um, promote um, closure of this leak space. 
And we do this both under endoscopy and then also under fluoroscopy, as you can see here. Through the scope clips, while they may play a role in bleeding, really play no role in closure of sleeve leaks. However, over the scope clips um, do play a role. And these are very effective in the early post sleeve leaks. Um, however, Usually what we are concerned about is that at six months, approximately 50% of these reopen. So they're very easy to place. Um, they're very successful in the short term, but you have to follow these patients closely. Another technique which I've adopted into my own practice over the past several years is septotomy. And this can really only be performed on late or chronic leaks because it requires a fibrotic septum in order to perform this procedure safely. And what is actually done is that the septum is divided, resulting in complete exposure of the leak cavity and allowing equalization of the pressures between the perigastric leak area and the stomach itself. And there's a whole slew of different devices that have been described in the very small number of patients that have been performed um, using this technique. I just wanna show you a quick video of a technique that we uh, performed using an insulated cutting knife. And while most of the other devices require several um, sessions, we were able to complete this entire, entire procedure in just one short session. And here you can see the insulated cutting knife. We're cutting the septum. Um, here you can see us removing any foreign material, which often includes staples. Um, since these leaks uh, are created sort of along a staple line. And then we use APC or argon plasma coagulation to help cauterize and also help burn the septum as well. And then finally go back to the insulated cutting knife to really promote complete um, division of the septum. And it's very important to reach the end of the cavity so that you equalize pressures. There are a whole slew of other techniques and devices that are available and others that are in development um, that you can see here. So in conclusion, prevalence of sleeve gastrectomy is clearly rising. Um, and despite overall safety and improvement in the performance of these procedures, complications do occur. So it's very important to be familiar with the anatomy and also endoscopic and medical management strategies. However, these should only be performed in the context of a comprehensive multidisciplinary center. Thank you.